Welcome to Richer Soul, Jamie Panetta. It's great to have you join us today. Thank you. I'm looking forward to talking to you. And I'm excited to learn from you today as well. We always like to start at the beginning. What was it like when you were growing up and how much did your family and school teach you about money? Mm. Sure. Um, so I uh, lived outside of the U.S. until I was about nine years old. And then I came to the U.S. from about nine to 18. And then I was on my own after 18. So my initial you know, first 18 years of my life were really with families that didn't talk a lot about money. Uh, and so I didn't get a, a, a strong education about finances and how to, you know, uh, treat your money and invest it and things like that. I mean, my family was, they weren't uh, well off, but they had enough, I think. And, and so I never felt uh, scarcity or, or anything like that. I always got all the Christmas toys I wanted, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> so so it never occurred to me to ask about money and they never talked about money. But, but I think what I learned from them was really the value behind money because my parents were really, uh, uh, they gave a lot of money away to organizations, to the church, to, to uh, you know, neighbors and things like that. And so I always understood that there was a lot of power behind having money available to give to others and to help others. So that, that value of the power of money to help others, I think, is, is one of the big influences that I got from, from my family. Um, but I, I've never had a, a really strong sort of uh, need for or want for, uh, you know, uh, making money. And, and and that's been, you know, my life, I think. That's interesting. So where did you grow up until nine? So I was born in Honduras, Central America. And uh, at nine, my parents thought that, uh, you know, that I had potential to go and get a better education. And so they sent me to the U.S. to live with family that I had here already in California. So this new family literally sponsored me and kind of adopted me, if you will. And so I lived with them for nine years. Now, initially, the idea was that I would only come for a few years, get it, you know, go through high school, maybe, and, and then go back. But once you taste the freedom of, you know, the freedom in the U.S. and the potential for, you know, uh, I, I didn't want to go back. And so I, I, I stayed, basically. So that was it. Yeah, that was it. And is that why you were on your own at 18? Yeah, basically, I I, uh, I thought I, I was uh, independent enough by that time that uh, I, I wanted to leave this second uh, family, if you will. And uh, so I, I actually joined the military. Uh, so I spent five years in the uh, Air Force. Uh, and, uh, and that gave me a bridge, if you will, into, into then once I got out of the air force, I was an adult by that time. I knew what I wanted to do. I got married and developed a family and a career and, you know, and all that, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. I was going to ask you, like, how do you get started at 18 with, you know, whether or not you had, but. When you join the military, right? That's one way to do it. <laughs> they give you uh they give you essentially everything you need, correct? <laughs> they did, you know, and, and 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 really it took me a while to think about that because I, I, I was in the same situation, you know, what do I do? If I just go, do I go? What do I do? Uh and uh, the military was a good option. And at that time the military was this was post Vietnam, 1974. Uh, they were actually recruiting heavily for volunteers to join the military. And they were uh, offering all sorts of incentives, the GI Bill, and, uh, you know, going overseas to Europe and you know, all that, you know, uh, training and all sorts of things that just sounded uh, excellent for me to, to make that jump. Um, and so I did. I, when I joined the military, I ended up in Europe, I, I, in Germany for two years. And then I came back to the U.S. I worked at the Pentagon for a while, for a couple of years. So I, it was actually a quite a interesting experience. I learned a lot. 
was trained uh, as a computer systems analyst. And so, you know, they gave me an opportunity to do work in, in that area. So it was very good a bridge, if you will. Yeah. And now you're a PhD. What was, what was your PhD in? Yeah. So uh, I was always interested in, in psychology from the very beginning. And part of it was because of this change that I had undergone at nine years of age, where I left my family, my friends, my culture, went into a, a new culture, a new language. And so I was always interested in this idea of identity. You know, what makes you who, you, who I am? Yeah, because I really had to define or find myself in this new world. Uh, and, and it was always fascinating to me. How did that come about? How do I go about making a new me? So psychology uh, was of interest. I got an undergrad degree in psychology. Uh, and then I decided I needed to learn more about how the psychology came about. And I wanted to learn about the brain, the hardware part of the, of the whole thing. And so I decided to go into uh, neuroscience, which is the study of the hardware, the you know, neurochemistry, neurophysiology of the brain, and how that underlies the mind, basically. That's an interesting path there. And I've got to believe it took a lot of courage to make those choices. Uh, you did it twice. I mean, one at nine and again at 18, <laughs> both times leaving essentially safety Mm -hmm. And everything you knew for an uncertain future, which is not easy to do. It's not easy to do. And and I remember, uh, at least when I decided to go to grad school, I had a, I had a job at that time. I was married and uh, making good salary as a computer programmer. But I wanted to go to school. I wanted to pursue this PhD. But it meant really literally going into uh, poverty, <laughs> you know, because as a student, you don't, you don't make anything, right? <laughs> and so I went from a very good job to essentially not making anything. But I, I felt that I needed to do that. And so, like you're saying, it, it felt like jumping into the unknown for me. And uh, it took a lot, a lot of convincing my wife, convincing <laughs> myself that this was uh, the right thing to do without really knowing the end result. And, uh, but it, it worked out. And so, you know, looking back, I'm, I'm glad I did it. I find that most people aren't willing to take those types of leaps. Have you seen that people are, or are you just an anomaly that you're willing to, to consistently make those jumps? And if so, how did that come to be? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you're asking the, 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 the fundamental question that really motivated me to write this book, because really uh, part of what happens with humans is we get uh, easily get into uh, comfort and, and, and not wanting to change. You know, we, we get uh, um, afraid of, of novelty and afraid of trying new things because it's too easy to lose everything you work for and, and, and that kind of thing. I think most people are that way. There are some individuals who have this sense of adventure and willingness to try novel things, you know, so maybe I, I was just part of that group. Um, but, but I remember it took a lot. It, it, it wasn't like, oh, okay, let me just jump into this thing. You know, it took a lot of energy, a lot of thinking, a lot of uh, thoughtful processes to do it. And, um, but, but in the book, I, I talk about this. Uh, I'm sorry, were you going to ask something? No, go ahead about, talk about the book. No, I, so, so the, uh, what happens, you know, when we're, when we're infants, I, I talk about this, this thing that we, we come into the world as very creative beings. You know, if you think of an infant, they come into the world and they don't know anything about the world, but within the first few years, they learn how to adapt to it, how to, they learn the language of the world, they learn how to understand other beings in this world. I mean, it's an amazing set of skills that we develop within the first couple of years. So it's an amazing creative brain that comes and, and adapts. But I think what happens slowly is that we start and uh, 
remembering how we did things. And at some point, we began to depend on those memories more than on the creative nature that we are, right? And, and so th there, there is in a lot of people this, this flip. So you go from this creative being to this other thing, which is more comfortable with how I did things before. And therefore, I act out of my experiences and my memory because that, that's really what drives me you know um and, and 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 so making that switch is 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 really interesting uh, i say in the book that it's possible to recover your the kind of creative mind you had as a youngster right but one of the things that you need to do is kind of set aside this dependency on what how you did things before how you acted before so it's my understanding, and I, I, I don't have the, the educational background that you do, but between the ages of zero and six, the mind is, um, I don't know what the right words to use are, it's in a state of being that allows it to absorb information very quickly, very easily, and to essentially process, memorize. I mean, if you think about it, as you said, we learn to do all these things. We learn one, if not more, multiple languages if we're exposed to that, all without a book, all without a teacher, right? Yeah. <laughs> Essentially. Yeah. And I guess my question is, is are we wasting the first six years of a kid's life by not naturally exposing them to a lot more opportunities to just sponge in information. Oh, absolutely. So, so uh, the brain has what we call uh, neuroplasticity, that it's able to change based on the experiences that it receives, right? And so if, if the experiences that you're getting are rich and, and supportive and, you know, you're getting a lot of love and, and all that, the brain just flowers in the, in that kind of environment, right? If if on the other hand you're in a impoverished environment where there isn't a lot of input, there isn't a lot of exposure to things, to music, to other individuals, you know, it, it's a very poor environment. You can see the brain shrinks, and it, and the difference between an enriched brain and an impoverished brain. These are studies that have been done with animals over and over. It's a huge difference. So providing the right input at, a, at an early age makes the brain grow. So the brain is able to adapt to, to its environment. That, that's the key. It can adapt to any environment. Just like you're pouring, you know, you pour water into a, a glass and depending on the shape of the glass, it takes that shape. That's like the brain. The brain in a, in a certain environment will adapt to that environment. So if it's a poor environment, it adapts that way. If it's a rich environment, it adapts that way. Which begs the question, if you're handing a kid an iPad at two, what kind of an environment are you creating, <laughs> even unintentionally, of this is the world? and this is how it works, it seems to me you're missing so much. And if you really aren't careful with what those inputs are, yeah. you're probably setting up a person for failure. Absolutely. Totally agree. Yeah, so it depends on, on the inputs again. The, the brain takes anything. The brain it has no morality to it or whatever. It just takes whatever you give it and it adapts to it, right? So you have to know, be wise about the kinds of inputs that you give it, both as a parent, you know, to your children or, or for yourself. And, and the thing to keep in mind is that that kind of filtering needs to occur throughout your entire life, not only as a child, even now as adults we can be exposed to things that we shouldn't be exposed to. And it changes our, our brains in a certain way. And it changes how we respond to the world in a certain way. Right. Uh, so we need to be careful as to what we see, what we hear, what we experience for sure. Interesting. I know we were careful when our kids were young, but I didn't know why. 
now I think <laughs> science is caught up and I'm like, good thing we did what we did because yeah. it created the right base programming for them when they were when they were young. One of the things Great. that I noticed you said early in the book, and I'd love to get your mm -hmm. thoughts on this. And this is a quote. I realized that the purpose of life was to enjoy the simple act of being and experiencing the world. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, so let me go back to the, my, my experience. So part of my perspective is not only coming from a scientific perspective, but I also spent 30 years in uh, what, what's called contemplative practices. I do a lot of meditation, you know, so for 30 years, I've been practicing these contemplative mindfulness meditation, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, and I think at some point, the two, the two align. So for, from from the professional scientific perspective, I always had the goal to achieve. You know, I always wanted to, you know, there's a saying in our university, publish or perish. I always had to, you know, publish something and be active doing things, doing things, doing things, or or I wouldn't get the promotion or the the grants or, you know, whatever. And so that was the driving force. But at some point I realized that a better motivator of action is really just the sense of uh, happiness, joy that you feel about doing things, right? So it's a, it's, a, it's a different perspective. You're still doing things, but you're doing it because you enjoy things, not because you have to get that outcome, right? And, and so, so that sense of enjoyment of simply being yourself leads you to what I think are the, the right outcomes, but, but you're coming at it from this other perspective, right? And that became clearer to me as I grew older, uh, that, that really for me, the purpose of my life was to come to the world from this sort of joyful, sort of wanting to experience curiosity about the world and that that would bring the fruits of, you know, whatever I wanted. And I've noticed sense. there's kind of, <laughs> Yeah, it does. Today, there seems to be a merging back of spirituality and science. They separated hundreds of years ago, and it seems like they're kind of coming back together, and that kind of encapsulates what you're talking about. Yeah. And we didn't chat about this, and I didn't notice it in your book, hmm. but what we're starting to see in the sciences is using drug therapy to help hmm. rewrite old patterns. Is that something you've been involved in or researched or is that outside your realm? No, I was, I was actually doing some of those uh, studies. Um, so drugs literally uh, rewire your brain, right? So they can, and then they, and they cause certain behaviors uh, that are either rewarding or or not, right? And so depending on whether it's a rewarding effect, you want to keep doing that drug or you want to keep taking that drug, right? Um, and 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 by doing that, by that repetitive action, it's it's like learning any skill. You know, you're learning how to play the piano. You keep repeating that, you get better at it. Well, in this case, you get better at addiction. If you keep repeating, taking this drug, which causes pleasure, you know, which causes you to want more, et cetera. Uh, so, so drugs can have that negative, powerful effects, but they can also be useful, right? If, if you're suffering from pain and you take a, a pain killer or some sort of pain anesthetic, it relieves you of that pain. And, and that's a wonderful thing that can help you sort of move forward. So there are both both sides to to drugs. Let's chat a little bit about the book. What inspired you to write the book Controlling Mental Chaos, Harnessing the Power of the Creative Mind? I think the basic motivation was really I wanted to help others. And I and I I you know, since I had certain insights based on my study of the brain and the mind for 30 years and based on my practice of you know mindfulness meditation for those 30 years 
I had gotten some insights into how people come to be anxious and fearful and, and panicky and, you know, and what's going on in your brain when that happens. But also the other side is how to calm that down. So I had some insights about those things and I wanted to share them with, with people. And so this book is basically that. It's a self-help book on what is it, what happens when you go into chaos? You know, when you start, your mind is spinning and spinning and you can't find a solution to a problem and, and you get fearful and you get anxious and you get, you know, et cetera. What's going on in your head? And then the other side is, what can you do about it? How can you learn to control that so that you don't spin into that sort of chaotic mind? So that's the million-dollar question. How do we stop the monkey mind? <laughs> that is the million-dollar question. <laughs> right. So, you know, so the thing uh, is that you can't stop the mind, right? So, so that's the basic thing. It's not that you're stopping the mind. So the way I look at it is this, the chaotic mind, I think of it as unfocused creativity, unfocused creativity. And all you need to do is focus that energy because it's an energy in your mind that's creating all this chatter and you know all these feelings and so on. And so the question is, how do you focus that creativity? And we now know from science that there are a number of things that you can do to do that. You can start by practicing relaxation, for example. So when you're, when you're feeling all this anxious behavior, the first thing to do is quiet down, try to calm yourself, go for a walk, listen to music, do some exercise. And, and that then helps the, the system, if you will, you know, this chaotic system, just calm down a little bit. And then when you're at a certain level, you can then engage your mind and think about what is it that I'm thinking about and, and experience those things, not in order to solve them, but just to experience them. So what's going on in my head? Why am I fearful? What does fear feel like in me? Again, it's not to try to solve the problem, but just to experience it. So that's kind of like the second set of things that you do. You calm yourself. You then try to, what we call, embody these things, embody the fear, embody the, the anxiety. And what happens after that is that you're, you're, you're actually, your body has an intelligence to it that will help you begin to get out of that sense of anxiety. You'll begin to recognize, oh, when this happens, I go into this kind of anxious mode. And then you think about what is it that, that that thing that causes it is, and you go into that. Again, not to solve it, but just to experience it. And, and so little by little, you, you, you begin to realize that it's really just thoughts that are driving all this stuff. It's really just your mind going haywire. And, and, and thoughts are just bursts of energy, right? They're just bursts of energy that occur. So if you if you simply let them go, things will calm down naturally. How do you just let them go? <laughs> well, so this is this is the thing that it's uh, you know it, it's not a magical one time thing that that you have to do. You have to practice these things, and, and so practicing, say, relaxation, you know, five minutes of taking a walk, and and or listening to some beautiful music can, can help you regain that sense of calmness, right? So, so it's, it's not magic. It's, it's really, there are a lot of number of things that you, one can do. Uh, you can meditate, you can exercise, you can uh, dance, uh, a number of things that one can do to get your organism, which is all wired and all that, to sort of calm down. And like I said, the second part then is once you're at a level where you can just sit and, and experience your, your thoughts, your mind, it's like watching a movie. You just sit there and watch that movie and say, oh, this is what's going on in my mind. I keep thinking about all the fear that I have about this and that. And, and you just experience it. 
And the magic is that by just doing that, by simply experiencing it, it begins to sort of fade away. Because again, they're just thoughts. Your, your brain is an idea generator. So it generates this idea of fear. But then, you know, if you, if you simply watch that, it, it just goes like, it just fades, right? Again, it sounds like magic and it doesn't occur in, a, in one session. So you, you have to keep practicing this, this, these things that I'm, I'm talking about. And in the book, I give a number of exercises that one can try, you know? Yeah. And you've got a, a framework in the book. You, you've created an app. Acronym, which was Ruby, R-U-B-I, which yeah. was to recognize the illusion of separation, mm -hmm. understanding why it's so important of what it is that we're facing, finding mm -hmm. the right balance between living in the past and living in the present. And it, it's funny because you didn't even say living in the future. <laughs> and then how to implement answers to ground ourselves in the now. So it's the recognizing, understanding, the balance yeah. in the implementation. Yes. Um, what do you mean by the illusion of separation? How do we, what are we looking for there? Yeah, so this is this is you 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 have to be a psychologist, I guess, to to get into into that idea. But uh, the 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 sense that who we are, who you are, who I am, this we come with an initial sense that we are kind of an individual in a, in a in a body, you know, uh, and so forth, uh, which is which is normal, right? But then we begin to associate that sense of self with things like, I'm not a good person, or I'm a selfish person, or I don't have enough motivation to, to do things, right? And so we begin to associate the sense of self with ideas about who we are. And it's those ideas of who we are. That's the illusion, because we just create a whole cloth. Because somebody tells us that, you know, our teacher said, you are worthless, you can't do anything. And, and so we sort of take that in and we say, oh, okay, I'm not worth anything. But that's an idea. It's, it's, it's an illusion because you really are not that. So that's what I mean. The thoughts that we have about who we are, that we created because either somebody else told us, because we began to believe those things, because of our experience, the traumas that we had, all those things create this cloud, if you will, of who we are, which, which I, many people think of is, is an illusion in the sense that it's not real. You know? Right. Yeah. Does that make sense? And if we, <laughs> it, it makes total sense. And if we tell our mind we're X, our mind will go about proving X, won't it? Absolutely. So that's the power of the mind. That's the power of the mind that you can tell yourself you're this, but you can also tell you it, that you're something more positive, right? Yeah, and, and, and that's again, what it I takes call time. That. So it's that. Go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say that that that's the the subtitle of the book is harnessing that power, harnessing the power of your mind to to be more creative. Is is really telling yourself, you know, yeah, I, I can do this. You know, it's just, uh, just because somebody said you can't do it, I can do it. Yeah. You talk about the right balance between living in the past and living in the present. Should we live in the past at all? Or Great should we question. let go of it? Wonderful question. No, no. So, so uh, it has to be a balance. We learn things that are, you know, memories of the past, and we use those to learn how to behave in the future. That's a wonderful skill that humans have, right? You learn how to play the piano or the guitar. You don't want to forget that. You want to enjoy that, right? And you take it forth, those memories. So living in the past is absolutely necessary. It's when it becomes the sole thing that we do, only living in the past. 
that's when it becomes a problem. And so the balance that I talk about is learning when it's appropriate to do that versus when it's appropriate to think about the future or when it's appropriate to simply live life in the present, in the present moment. There are three different things that we're able to do, right? But we tend to live mainly in the past. And, and what's interesting, you pointed out that I don't talk about the future. And it's because living in the past creates already the future that we're going to have. Um, we talk about scientists, talk about the brain as a predictor, as a predictive device, which uses the past to predict the future. And so when you're living in the past, you automatically are predicting your future. There's a, a tight connection between the two, right? Uh, so, so, right, so past, future are, are tightly connected. What I argue for in the book is that we tend not to live in the present. That, that's a skill that's not taught in, in school, that's not taught at home. And you know, you don't hear about it at all. And it turns out that in fact, it's an amazing skill because it brings all sorts of uh, strategies that you, you didn't have access to before. So when you live in the present, all it means is you're moving away from memories, moving away from future. So you're not uh, a prisoner of those things and you're in the moment being creative. So when you want to get into a sense of creativity, get into living in the moment, living in the present, and you have access to those skills that are more creative, that engage things in novel ways, instead of depending on the past, etc. Yeah. So you said, we're not taught this in school. Our parents don't teach it. Sounds like money, but that's a whole nother day. <laughs> how, how do we live in this moment? Yes. What are some of those ways? Yeah. It's, it's, it's the easiest thing, and yet it's the hardest thing. Because if I ask you to just simply sit there and feel where you are, feel that you're right there sitting in a chair at this moment in time, talking to someone, talking to me, just being in that moment is being in the present, right? You're simply aware of what's happening to you all your senses at this moment in time, right? You're smelling the air or you're feeling the air conditioner or whatever. It, you know, at that moment, this is what's going on. That's being in the present, right? You, you fill your mind with what's happening to you at that moment. And, and what happens naturally when you do that is you disconnect with your memory. This is something that we know from science in the brain. You start disconnecting from memories and you begin to engage more creative kinds of thinking when you're present. Um, so this is what I encourage people to try to do right? because, because it's a skill that's underdeveloped and it just provides you with this amazing set of uh, things that we can talk about. But um you begin to recognize those things as soon as you begin to practice. So one thing, for example, as soon as you get into this moment, the problems that you had sort of kind of disappear. At that moment, if you're focused on being here, being now, there's no thought of what I'm going to do tomorrow, what I'm going to do in the past, right? You're just here present. So you're disengaging with the problems. If you can give your mind a break from all those problems by doing that, think about it. If you do that every day, your mind begins to appreciate the fact that you're not so focused on past, present problems. You're just simply being here, experiencing this moment. And there's nothing you need to do. You just simply are there, feeling your body, feeling your breath, feeling your skin, smelling, seeing the things you're seeing, hearing the things you're hearing, right? It's, it's, it's a wonderful world to be in. So, yeah. It is. To me, that's being in the flow mm -hmm. and just being in the moment and, and 
it leads to creativity that you can you can actually focus on creating and when I say creativity, so I'm in the business world. For me, when I get into that situation, I can look at situations and think of new ways to solve them. Um, mm -hmm. It's not creativity of like, for me, it's not creating a piece of art. It's more creating new ideas or, or playing through all of that. Absolutely. Yes. How does ego play into all of this? Yeah. Yeah. So good, good question. So, so ego is the way I, I see it is the giving uh, substance to those ideas that we talked about before that you develop and you create this cloud of ideas of who you are, right? That you're worthless or that you're, you, you have deficits in this and deficits in that or, or that you don't have friends and are lonely. All these ideas, like I said, they create this cloud of being that we begin to associate as, a, as the real me. That I see it as an ego. And, and what it does is it distorts. Anything that comes into your being goes through that cloud of distortion, right? So as people talk to you, but you go through this distorting filter that says, but I'm not worthy of what you're telling me, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, so the ego is just this distortion cloud that, that we create. But just like we can create it, we can undo it, right? You can, you can just, not as easily, but you can begin to undo, undo the ego. And, and, and the way that I've experienced it, and this is the way, you know, I talk about in the book, because I went through that experience myself. So uh, is by simply noticing, noticing these things. And over time, you, you notice, 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 notice. I keep saying that I'm worthless. Why do I do? Yeah, I keep saying that. Notice, notice, notice. And eventually you realize, gosh, that's just a thought I've had. And I've had it since I was 10 years old. You know, why? I don't need to think that anymore. You know, I'm not that thought. And what begins to come through is this notion that you are not your thoughts. You can have all sorts of thoughts, but you don't need to identify with those thoughts. So you are not th those things that you, that you think about. You're more than that, more than those thoughts. And, and then you begin to want to know what is it that's more than the thoughts? What's behind the ego? What's behind the thinking, Right. And this, we begin to get into more spiritual kinds of things, right? Where there are no words to describe these things, but we are not our thoughts. That's the key point. Are you seeing within your field that there's more of an acceptance of that spiritual side? And that in looking at it, there is actually scientific, I'm not going to say proof, but scientific basis in, in all of that? Yes, there, there's more and more science behind the fact that in addition to the intellect, which is what we typically associate with ego, with thinking, you know, this intellect, there's also a non-intellect, non-conceptual sense of being that you have. So imagine this, you're sitting there. 95% of the things that are going on in your body, you're not aware of. Your digestive system, your heart rate, something is controlling your heart rate to keep you alive. Your breathing, something is doing the breathing for you. Your immune system, something is doing the immune system for you, right? So if we think about it, 95% of the things that keeping, are keeping you alive are below this level of awareness, be, below the level of the intellect. And the way I think of it is that that system that's keeping you alive is an intelligent system, highly intelligent system that's doing all these things in the background, if you will, right? There's enormous amount of evidence that, in fact, that's true, that 95% of things we're not aware of and only a small percentage do we become aware of and say, oh, okay, I'm going to do this or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be this or I'm going to... That's only like about 5% of, of the things that we do. And what I'm arguing is that 
if you can get in touch with this intelligence that's below your level of awareness, then you begin to be more whole. You begin to act from this sort of deeper sense of who you are. And, and, and the, the basis for that is scientific. There, there's a lot of evidence that when you begin to, when you're in meditation, for example, the systems that control the intellect calm down and something else comes up right in your brain so you can do what i call fmri studies to show that you know the intellect your ego kind of slows down goes down and then something else comes online um so we have we have a lot of support for it yeah interesting and and that's I, and i mentioned that before and that's kind of what i'm seeing it seems like hundreds of years ago the church and the the science world split apart as they argued over things. And I think it's more the science world coming back to the spiritual more than spiritual. I don't know. Most of what I see is the science world finding some of these spiritual connections. And a lot Mm -hmm. of it seems to be coming from quantum physics and and coming back and then it's flowing into these other areas. One of the things that you talk about in the book is self-parenting the mind. Can you explain mm-hmm. what that means? Yeah, uh, basically self-parenting is learning to care for yourself. So, you know, we many individuals grow up without the, the right kind of parenting. You know, the, they, they miss out on the kind of love and the caring relationship that they get from uh, caretakers, from the parents. And they grow up with a, a hole, basically, in their personality that they can't fill because they missed out on all that love. Well, when you recognize that that's happened in your life, you can actually take care of some of that by loving yourself, by doing these what I call self-parenting exercises, where you begin to take care of that missing hole that you have. You, you provide love to yourself you begin to love yourself. And, uh, and I think that that's a basic requirement to then get to the kind of the next stages of things. So initially, before I talked about calming the system to a certain extent, self-parenting is also providing this kind of calming uh, nature so that you're up, you get to a point where you then can do other things, right? Because if you're simply sitting there and you're always lacking in something and you don't know what that is, you're never going to be able to move forward. So true. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that was in the book that we should have talked about? So I mentioned that when you start doing these practices, if you will, uh, so one of the practices that I talk about is not only self-parenting, but also living in the moment, right? Those are the two main things that I talk about. Uh, Engenders this sort of creative nature that you were once, right? You begin to be more curious about the world and you begin to explore it like you did when you were young, et cetera, et cetera. All that can happen with living in the moment. But the one thing that also happens, which I don't go into the book a lot, but it's, it's this idea that you begin to connect with other individuals. You begin to realize that they're, the importance of relationships just takes over, basically. At least for me, I, I, I was always a very uh, inter, uh, introverted sort of individual. But when I began to practice these things, this feeling of, oh my gosh, there are other people in the world. And I need to talk to those people and I need to make contact with it, including my family, right? But you felt this kind of from the bottom up kind of energy that came up saying, you need to make these connections. That was amazing. And 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 so you begin to realize that, that you are part of this network of others around you, family, friends, you know, even strangers that's, that comes with that. And I think that goes back to the religious part of the whole purpose of church is at least, you know, especially from the Christian side is, Mm -hmm. is to be the body of the church, meaning you all come together. So it's creating that, that relationship with everyone 
coming together, helping each other, supporting each other. And if yeah. you go back through history, I mean, we lived in much smaller groups where yeah. the group supported the group. Even the neighborhood supported the neighborhood. Today, we see much more disconnected. And, and there are parts and places where people are coming back together. But, and I think it almost goes back to what you talked about at the beginning with your parents. I would assume, maybe I'm wrong, hmm. but people in Honduras are probably a lot more connected because they almost have to be to survive. Maybe yes. that's not the case. Well, I think it, it, it used to be the case. I mean, it's like everything else in the world is becoming highly technical and technological and everybody's got their iPhones now and, you know, you, you feel more isolated rather than more connected. You know, uh, but you're right. I mean, when I was young, I remember I would get out early in the morning, like during uh, uh, the weekends, I would leave home even when I was like nine years old, I would leave home and wouldn't come back until nighttime because I would be out playing with my friends and, you know, and my parents didn't care. And, you know, but I, I was making connections with all these friends around town. Um, that doesn't happen anymore or less of it happens, you know. Uh, so things are changing. And I, and I think part of it is technology that, that's driving part of the changes, uh, part of the isolation. Um, maybe due to technology, although I don't, I don't know. I'm not an expert in that. Um, yeah. I know right now they're talking, especially amongst younger age groups, a whole bunch of anxiety, a whole bunch of, of different psychological things that are coming along. And I'm wondering how much of that simply has to do with that fact that a, they have very little agency. If you can walk out the door at 9 a.m. and not come home till 9 p.m., you have a tremendous amount of agency throughout your Absolutely. day. Absolutely, yes. Right? You get to pick. Absolutely. That's right. Kids today don't have any agency. Yeah. They're yeah. told what to do from the moment they wake up till they go to bed. Is that what's causing all of this, or is there other factors? I think that's one factor. I, I think there are other factors. I think what, what you mentioned uh in terms of church, for example, church used to provide a kind of infrastructure where we went to and and met and and talked to others and socialized and things like that. A lot of young folks don't go to church anymore. You know, less and less young people are going to church. Uh, church attendance is rapidly going down in the in the U.S. at least in the Western world. Uh, so we we don't have those structures that provide that sense of community. We don't have cities. It used to be, I lived in a city when I was young that had a central park with a church, you know, where we all went to and gathered, all the, all the neighbors went and gathered as a community. You know, that kind of very small town, of course, but we don't have that in big cities, right? So, so we're missing the infrastructure to provide that sense of community. And we're dependent on things like iPhones and things like that to to keep us in touch with other people. Uh, but that's a, a poor substitute for the in-person, real kind of thing. Um, so there are a variety of, of reasons, a variety of factors, I think. Interesting. Gives me a lot to think about and to ponder. And it's up to people... We were very intentional in creating a lot of these things. I did it for different reasons. I didn't understand back when we did it all this science, and I'm glad yeah. uh, I'm glad we took those choices as we did, and and we were intentional in in building that as we but, built it. And not we were a little bit lucky that my kids were slightly they were a little bit older by the time the iPhone came out. So yeah. they grew up in a slightly different era. They mm. were probably the last of that era. Mm. It's probably yeah. a lot harder today to be able to uh, to do that. They grew up with VCR tapes, so they still had to wait for it to rewind. <laughs> you know, they had to have a moment <laughs> of patience. <laughs> Absolutely, and, and that's what it. Yeah, that's what it is. Was there something else you wanted to add? 
No, no, just just a comment to what you just said, because it's interesting to me that that even though you didn't know the science or you didn't know you 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 ended up doing the right thing. And to me, that just says that there's something in us that knows what the right thing to do is. I I look at the our mind brain as wanting to do the right thing. There there's an innate sense that it wants to do the right things, but again we cover it up with all this nonsense, right? But but we if we if we can intuit those signals that come from our core, they're usually the right signals. And so as a parent, you need to be able to listen to those signals that tell you, hey, maybe this is not appropriate. This is appropriate, right? Um, so listen listen to that inner sense of that conscience, that, that inner, inner voice. I, I think that still works. I don't disagree with you. You just have to stop <laughs> and listen. Great. What's your secret? to living an abundant life? Yeah, great question. I think the secret for me is knowing that I already have it. Knowing that, you know, uh, I, I mean, this is how I feel. I feel my life is abundant. I don't need to ask for anything. I already have it. And, and things for me kind of manifest, if you will, you know, so... I think the secret is that. Believe that you're already there. What did you learn later in life that you wish you would have learned sooner? Oh, my gosh. Yes. Uh, the the main thing I learned is that I, I wish I hadn't be, been as fearful of things when I was young. Right? Fear drove a lot of the kind of bad behavior, bad decisions that I've made. And, and now I realize fear was just a thought I had. And, uh, and, you know, I try not to engage that. And I live better without it. If you were to give an 18-year-old one specific piece of wisdom, what would it be? Don't worry so much about outcomes. Focus more on enjoying what you have, what you are, and then the outcomes will come. I actually used to say that in my classes at school. Students are so focused on getting that A, and I said, don't focus on getting an A. Focus on enjoying the class, and the A will come, right? If you enjoy what you're learning, you'll get the A. If people would like to learn more about you, about the book, where can they find you? So the book is sold on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, uh, but I have a website called theunencumberedmind.com where they can go and look me up, theunencumberedmind.com. And we will put that link into the show notes. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really enjoyed it. Thank you for all the interesting questions. Thanks for checking out this unedited video of the Richer Soul podcast. You can find the full episode along with all the back episodes at richersoul.com. This podcast is brought to you by Profit Comes First, where we help business owners to have a more profitable and growing business so they can live the life of their dreams. Check that out as well wherever you listen to all this content.